Day 11. Robert Kennedy will one day write that on the 11th day of the Cuban Missile Crisis, he felt that this cup was not going to pass and that a direct military confrontation between the two great military powers was inevitable. Both hawks and doves sensed that our combination of limited force and diplomatic efforts had been unsuccessful. If the Russians continued to be adamant and continued to build up their missile strength, military force would be the only alternative. This is Time Ghost in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. Yesterday, American ambassador to the UN Adlai Stevenson faced off with his Soviet counterpart Valerian Zorin and made Zorin look foolish while proving to the world that the Soviets had in fact placed nuclear arms on Cuba. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev decided to offer the US a trade, guaranteed sovereignty over Cuba for removing his missiles. The so-called quarantine, an American naval blockade of Cuba, was in effect but there were no suspicious ships to stop as they had all turned back to Russia. This robbed the US of the chance to show the world how the blockade would be enforced. Finally, the Navy decided to board a seemingly random non-Russian ship to perform a demonstration. On the morning of October 26, 1962, this ship, the Lebanese freighter Markula, manned by a Greek crew, which took on cargo in Riga on its way to Havana, is moored to a US Navy destroyer in the waters east of Cuba. American President John F. Kennedy is following the board and search operations via radio link from the White House. As expected, the ship has no contraband on board and is allowed to proceed. At the same time, Kennedy has just received the morning newspapers and they are full of rumors of an imminent American invasion of Cuba. Considering that the US Army, Navy and Air Force have now amassed the greatest amount of men and equipment seen since the Korean War, both on and off the US East Coast, this is a fairly reasonable assumption. The letter from Khrushchev, a long one, offering the trade-off has not yet arrived. Khrushchev actually has other problems on this crisp Moscow morning. His ally in Cuba, Fidel Castro, is getting very nervous. Yesterday evening, he held a passionate public speech in Havana, promising to shoot down any Yankee spy planes that fly over the island. That's already not great for Khrushchev, but it gets worse when he receives Castro's Armageddon letter. It says, If the imperialists invade Cuba with the aim of occupying it, the dangers of their aggressive policy are so great that after such an invasion, the Soviet Union must never allow circumstances in which the imperialists could carry out a nuclear first strike against it. I tell you this because I believe that the imperialists' aggressiveness makes them extremely dangerous. However harsh and terrible the solution, there would be no other. In other words, in case of an invasion of Cuba, Castro wants the USSR to strike the US with nuclear force before the US themselves resort to nuclear weapons. Khrushchev could just simply not grant Castro's wish if it was not for those tactical frog missiles on Cuba, which if he wants to, Castro can seize and use himself. Not only could he fire at invading troops from a boat, he could get someone close enough to Florida to fire a couple at the American mainland. Needless to say, that would force both Khrushchev's and Kennedy's hands launch a nuclear war. While Khrushchev deals with Castro, an American invasion of Cuba is not fake news. President Kennedy is once again considering it. Remember, he still hasn't received Khrushchev's proposal. The topic of the day is what to do next since the blockade itself will not eliminate the nukes. Now, at the beginning of this XCOM meeting, there are two remarkable things that are covered. This happens before the president starts recording and in portions of the recording that have been excised and are still classified. But it's easy to piece together what's going on by looking at the references to these parts during the rest of the discussion and through other declassified documents. First of all, it's now known and confirmed that the US knows about the tactical frog missiles. They were photographed and identified on the 25th in one of the low altitude flybys. This does not stop discussion of an invasion. Instead, US forces with tactical nukes of their own are being made ready to take part in such an invasion. Second, Director McCone of the CIA 
now distances himself from a CIA operation to send small groups of Cuban exiles as sabotage crews to Cuba to take out the missiles and assassinate Castro. Remember back on day one, when I mentioned that Attorney General Robert Kennedy had been made the unofficial chairman of Operation Mongoose, the secret sabotage operation to disrupt Cuba and possibly eliminate Castro? Well, it turns out that ever since that first day of the crisis, McCone and Bobby Kennedy have been adapting these plans as an alternative to invasion to end the crisis. Now McCone does not want to proceed for fear of failing and getting the blame for another CIA-led debacle like the Bay of Pigs invasion. So on the advice of National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, it becomes part of the post-invasion plan instead. McCone informs them that the meeting to set that up is already underway. So this is how serious they are about an invasion. They're already planning how to take political and administrative control of Cuba afterwards. Another piece of important intelligence they receive is that the work to make the Soviet missiles launch ready is continuing. Many years later, it will come to light that already at this point, a mobile unit of two SS-4 missiles is deployable and set up only a few kilometers away from Guantanamo, the U.S. military base on Cuba. The XCOM members have concluded that even if the blockade is stopping new arms from coming in, it's not doing anything to get rid of the ones already there. With more and more missiles being readied, there's now a sense of urgency. In the next meeting, they look at their options to solve that problem. After the UN session and meetings with UN General Secretary U Tant yesterday in New York, Adlai Stevenson and Presidential Advisor John J. McCloy have traveled to Washington and are also part of that XCOM meeting. Both of them are in favor of negotiating with the Soviets through U Tant, possibly even lifting the blockade before those negotiations starts. McCone is not impressed. While these deliberations go on, others are suffering the consequences of the decisions made by the leaders on both sides of the Iron Curtain. The US Navy is now hard on the heels of the four Soviet submarines. They chase them from one location to the next, hitting them with signaling depth charges to try to get them to surface. The chase is so intense that the subs cannot even surface for fresh air or to reload their batteries. The conditions on board 
are becoming absolutely horrifying. One of the seamen writes in his diary dedicated to his wife. We're in the enemy's lair and we can't reveal our presence to them, but they sense our nearness and are searching for us. They detected us yesterday, but we managed to escape. Something exploded somewhere, but at a distance from us, so we don't know how serious it was. But here, inside the sub, the situation is very serious. The men are feeling notably worse. A lot of them are ill. People are fainting. Many have swollen feet. No one can sleep in this monstrous heat and stuffy air. Even though everyone is very tired and weak, everyone's skin is covered with rash. Some look like Indians. They put some antiseptic ointment, bright green in color, on their rash, and it got smeared all over their bodies because of the sweat. Today, two of the submarines run out of electricity and have to surface. They are allowed to recharge and are escorted back towards the USSR. The other two, the B-36 and the B-59, are still submerged and still evading the US Navy. By now, they have lost all contact with the outer world, most significantly with Central Command in Moscow. In such a scenario, they have orders to determine themselves whether or not to deploy their tactical nukes. In Washington, D.C., XCOM meets again. There's no action that, uh, other than diplomatic that we can take, which does not immediately get rid of these. There's only two ways to get rid of them, as I said this morning. One is the diplomatic way, which I doubt, I don't think is going to be successful. The other way is, I would think, a combination of an airstrike and probably invasion, which means that we would have to carry out both of those with the prospect that they might be fired. Now, let's be very clear about one thing here. These are plans and not actions. We should not misread this as saying that either of the two leaders want a war. As we have seen before, both are terrified of the idea. It's just that one action after the other on both sides has now led them down that path one little step at a time. It's safe to assume that the president heaves a small sigh of relief when he finally receives Khrushchev's offer this evening. That is, once he spent time reading and deciphering it, because it's long, it's rambling, and at times it's not very clear. What is crystal clear is that by now, both of them have long lost their grip on the leash that was supposed to hold back the dogs of war. Tomorrow, they will bark and bite as one insane event after the other escalates the crisis to the very brink of nuclear war. See you then on day 12. If you want to hear more from the diary of the Submariner, Spartacus has recorded it for you and it is right here. Do not forget to subscribe and please support our efforts financially at patreon.com or timeghost.tv so we can make more awesome history just like this. Good night and good luck.